Good morning, my name is Jerry. I'm one of the leaders here. At, one of the leaders here at Gospel Church. And this morning we're gonna take a look at a a topic that probably affects everybody here in this room. It's a topic of letting Jesus heal your broken heart. Has anyone here ever had a, a broken heart? Raise your hand. Yeah? Everyone here has probably had a, a broken heart at, at one point or another. There was a, uh, a time about maybe 25 years ago where uh, my heart was really, really broken. There was uh, a person who had gathered some other people against me and there were some false accusations that were made, lots and lots of hurtful things. And as a result of all these lies and accusations, a lot of my friends uh, left me. Uh, I lost a lot of things. But God is one who wants to heal our broken heart. And he came to me and he touched me and he healed me and he taught me how to forgive and how to bless. In fact, if you live in this world, there will be a time when you will be hurt. But you need to make a decision. What will you do next? And in fact, probably each one of us will also know somebody who has been hurt. And we also need to make a decision. What will we do with this person? Will we leave them in their hurt? Or will we help them somehow? Part of Jesus' mission here on earth was to heal the brokenhearted. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. This was quoted by Jesus in the New Testament, but uh, let's take a look at the verse that's in the Old Testament. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And let's also take a look at Psalms 147, verse 3, talking about God. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. If you are brokenhearted today, this is God's desire for you. He doesn't want you to remain in your hurt. He doesn't want you to remain in your pain. But he wants to come and to heal your broken heart. Well, there's many reasons why our, our hearts can be broken. There's many reasons why we can be hurt in this world, simply because we live in a, in a broken and sinful world. But maybe it's because you lost somebody that you love. They died. Or maybe a relationship that you had that was good fell apart. Maybe you loved somebody and they decided at some point in time not to love you back. Or your marriage fell apart. Or your health deteriorated. Or you lost your job, you lost your money, you lost some possessions, you lost something valuable. Or maybe you even lost your freedom and you started drinking and smoking and taking drugs and you got addicted to something. Every time something bad happens to us, we have the opportunity to be wounded. And we have the opportunity to, to feel hurt. In every such situation, the pain is real and the loss is real, but we don't have to remain in that situation. I asked, uh, where is Nate? Uh, I'm going to ask Nate to come forward, and he's going to read a portion from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 25. Uh, and this is what we're going to take a look at today's story in our sermon. Okay. 
So this is uh, Luke ch uh, chapter 24, verse 13, 35. Uh, that very day, two of them were going to a village named uh, Emmaus. 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 You were telling me that earlier. The correct pronunciation. About seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you talk, as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to, the, to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, put a little bit of context here into the story. Uh, this story here is about uh, Easter, which we celebrated not long ago. But go back about a week or two weeks before Easter. And what was the situation? Remember, a week earlier, it was Palm Sunday. They were coming into Jerusalem. Everyone was happy. They were excited. Everyone had put their hope and their faith in Jesus. They were expecting Jesus to take his seat on a throne for him to redeem Israel, for him to set up his kingdom. All his disciples were excited. There was joy in the city. There were many expectations. There were many things that they were hoping that would happen. But then Friday came and all their dreams were shattered. Their closest friend, their Savior, their Lord was crucified and everything they had thought was going to happen just fell apart in front of them. And they were just utterly broken. They were upset. They were, they didn't know what to feel, what to think. There was just an empty hole in their hearts. They were full of sadness and, and depression. And you know, How can this happen? They felt a great loss. And their whole purpose in life seemed to be destroyed at their moment, at that moment. And because of the situation, I think they were very wounded in their hearts. Jesus, we trusted you and look what happened. And here in this story, the disciples who were to stay in Jerusalem and were to wait there 
we see these two disciples leave the church, get up, and walk away. And they start walking to a place called Emmaus. Jesus had specifically told everyone, wait in Jerusalem. But these two, because of the emptiness, because of the sadness, the brokenness, they just left where God wanted them to be. They left their church, their family, and they started going in the opposite direction. They forgot everything that Jesus had told them. And sometimes this is a picture of people in the church, that when we get hurt, when things happen to us that, that we don't expect, we lose sight of God. And some of us, sometimes we walk away from church. We walk away from the things that God has called us to do. We walk away from our closest family and our friends. Think of those disappointed dis disciples who felt this emptiness inside. Jesus didn't leave them in this condition. As we read, part of Jesus' mission was to come and to heal broken hearts. Whether it's the broken hearts of these two disciples or it's your broken heart, it doesn't make any difference to him. In fact, these two guys are on the wrong road. They're going away from where they should have been. And Jesus didn't let them leave so easily. He got on the road and he found them, made contact with them, and started walking with them. In the story, Jesus doesn't condemn their emotions and their feelings. It's okay. God has created us with emotions and feelings. It's not wrong to have them. And when we lose something, yes, we feel an emptiness and we feel a pain. We see, even see Jesus feels emotions and pain. Remember when his good friend Lazarus died. Even though he knew that he would raise him from the dead, he felt sad. He cried. Even though he knew he would be risen again. It's not bad to have emotions. But it's bad to let emotions rule our life and control our life. The disciples, instead of listening to what they were told, they decided, we're just going to leave God's plan. We're going to leave God's place. And they walked away. In my opinion, there's a few things that we can learn from this story. Number one, that Jesus comes to meet us where we are, even if we're on the wrong road, going in the wrong direction. Number two, that Jesus is a wonderful counselor and wants to counsel us. And number three, that Jesus is a wonderful friend who wants to be there in our darkest times. And number four, that Jesus is the one who wants to heal us. Let's take a look at the first point, that Jesus met the disciples where they were. He got on the same road where they were, made contact with them. Jesus wasn't there saying, well, I'm just going to wait until they return to Jerusalem and then talk to them. He didn't wait for them to get their lives in order. He met them where they were. He didn't say, I'm going to wait for them to see their mistake. I'm going to wait for them to repent. He said, I need to go and reach out to them. And he began talking to them. And he 
ask them a question. Of course, Jesus doesn't have to ask questions because he knows everything. But he asked a question because he wanted to start some type of interaction with them. He wanted them to, to open up a little bit. He wanted to get into some type of relationship with them. And he asked them a question. You know, what are you guys talking about? And in verse 17 we read, And they said to him, uh, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. Jesus had a purpose to come up to them, to heal them. But they didn't recognize him. It says they were prevented from recognizing him. And I was thinking, how is that? They, they walked with him, they... They ate with him. They knew what he looked like, but they didn't recognize him. How is that? Well, either God prevented them from recognizing him, which is one possibility. But I think there is also another possibility, that when we're hurt, we can't see God. We don't recognize Jesus in our life. We don't recognize God working in our life. Because our focus is so much on the hurt and the pain, we don't see God. So they didn't see Jesus in the man who was accompanying them. Jesus, though, is a counselor. He was a person who listened. Many times when, when we meet our friends and they have some type of problem, I don't know if you've done it, but I've done it. I don't wait for them to, to share everything. I just want to jump in, cut them off, interrupt them and say, you know, I got the answer to your problems. You ever do that? that you don't let your friends share all their hurt and their pain. But here in this story, we see Jesus didn't interrupt them. He didn't say, wait, wait, wait. Let me explain everything to you. First, he let them share everything that was on their hearts, everything that was on their mind. He let them let that hurt out of their life. If we want to minister like Jesus ministers to others. We need to be able to sit and to listen and let other people share their hurts and their frustrations and their pain. If we spend time with people and we build our relationship with them, we will be more effective later when they open up and let us into their life. And as they were discussing their problems, the disciples asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened in these days? And Jesus, again, he asked another question. He says, what things? So he asked them questions. He allows them to, to open up and to share their hearts. And of course, he didn't have to ask the question. He knew what was going on, but he deliberately did so, so that they can not hold the pain in their heart, but they can let it out. And they told him in verse 19, about Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, about how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned, and they crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day that all these things have happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But they did not see him. 
Here, these two guys share that they had known Jesus. They had walked with Jesus once. They had seen his powerful acts, his deeds, his healings, his miracles. They had been a part of his ministry. And that there was false accusations, there was unfair trial, that their friend was whipped and beaten, falsely accused and executed. They had hoped and they had dreamed about being with Jesus and being a part of what Jesus had planned, but their dreams were all shattered. They talked about the women and maybe these women went crazy thinking they saw something. Jesus allowed them to, to share everything. And when they shared, then it was his turn to start talking. Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them all that the scriptures had said concerning himself. So how did he help them? He didn't get them to sign up for some new method of psychology. He didn't ask them to start doing yoga or meditation. He didn't ask them to, to see some specialist, but he started sharing God's word with them. He started sharing all the passages that concern the situation. Many times when people share their problems with us, instead of going to the scriptures, we give them our own human wisdom and thinking. Now, if it's based and built upon the word of God and our experiences with God, that's okay. But if it's only worldly wisdom, it's not gonna really help them. People don't need human advice. People need God in their life. Jesus used the same thing that they were talking about, about the death and the crucifixion. And he started pointing out scriptures. You know, that's how we can also help people. But we can't share scriptures if we don't know the scriptures. And so if we know someone that's going through a particular problem or situation, if we've been studying the word of God, we can think, oh, here in this fragment, there's something that says something about this. And we can use that to share with others. Jesus used this bad situation that they were in and he inserted scripture into that to give them hope, to turn their sadness into joy. The third thing is we see that Jesus is a true friend. friend. It says that he explained everything to them. And there are a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament that, that talked about Jesus' life and about his uh, betrayal, about his trials, about his crucifixion, and also about his resurrection. So I'm sure that while they are walking together, he shared lots and lots of scriptures from the word of God. Verse 28, so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, staying, saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Here we see another principle in, in being a counselor and being a friend. We can't help someone until they invite us in. These two guys, they urged Jesus. They said, we invite you into our lives. We invite you to come and stay with us. You know, it's very hard to, to help somebody if they don't let us into their heart. 
and they don't let us into their life. So we need to make that contact first. We need to make that relationship first. We first need to show them that we love them, that we care about them, that we're not going to hurt them. And then when people invite us into their life, we can share the Word of God. We can share what God has done in our own lives. Jesus pretended that he was going to go further and he expected that they would say, hey, don't go. We want you to come. We want you to stay with us. Jesus didn't presume and say, hey, I need to go to your house and I need to talk to you some more. I need to show you something. But he placed the responsibility on their shoulders. Hey, do you want to have a relationship with me? Do you want to invite me in? He showed them hope. He made contact, but they had to take the responsibility to continue and build that relationship. Because Jesus is a gentleman. He never forces himself on anyone. Remember, in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Jesus kicks in the door to our house. No, it says, he stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone lets him in, he'll come in. Jesus never forces his way into our life, but he creates possibilities for us to invite him. He made contact with these guys and they invited him in. Not everyone who was hurt leaves the church. Some people leave and some people stay. Many people stay in church and they're hoping that someone would come up to them and be their friend. Hoping that someone would love them, be interested in them, care about them, ask them how you can help them. We as a church, we need to be sensitive to those around us. Because in fact, all of us will be in one category or the other. We'll either be hurting ourselves or we'll know somebody who's hurting. And it's there that God wants to use you to reach out and to touch other people. See, the church should be a, a place where relationships are built. You know, we talked a little bit or sang a little bit about uh, relationships last week. Pastor Clinton was talking also about relationships, about having a, a Paul in your life, a Barnabas in your life, and a Timothy in your life. The church is built upon relationships. You can't be uh, in just relationship, you and God alone and, and nobody else. That's not the way things work. It was God's desire and it's God's plan that he would have a church. And the church means many different people, many different backgrounds, many different skills, talents, and experience all together as one family. The church provides us an opportunity to reach out to others who are hurting, gives us an opportunity to share with people, to love people, to care for people, to minister to their needs. But sometimes it's difficult if, if we don't take the time to build those relationships because it's difficult as the church grows to, to have an in-depth conversation after church on Sunday because 10 or 15 people want to shake your hand and say hello. So those relationships, they really need to be built outside of church. So think about you know today after church, who can I go out with for coffee or tea or invite to my house for a meal or, or just go for a walk in the park? Who can I reach out to and build a relationship with? We need to take initiatives to build relationships, to allow others to open up, to let us into their life. I remember when, as a young believer living in the United States, I started going to this wonderful church. 
the, the pastor, he was on fire for God. The worship was uh, wonderful. It was something new and fresh. The teaching was excellent. And I started going to this church and everything in the church was fine, but I was not fine. I was hurt. I had grew up without any father in my life. And I had a lot of pain and a lot of resentment towards my father who had left us. And I carried a lot of hurt and a lot of pain in my heart. And although everything in the church was great, I placed expectations on people. I was waiting. When is someone after church going to come and invite me to their house and get to know me? When is someone going to come and say, Jerry, you're a wonderful guy? When is someone going to come over and say, you know, Jerry, we just want to have a good relationship with you? And I went to church every week expecting, when are people that going to come and minister to me? And I would have been there for a very, very long time. Not that the people were, were bad or anything like that, because there was lots of people in the church and I, was, I just got lost in the, in the crowd of people that were there. But God started speaking to me and he said, hey, you need to take an initiative. Stop thinking that people need to come to you. You need to start going to people. And as I started reaching out to people and I started to being, get interested in what was happening in other people's lives. I stopped being that, that guy that sat in the back corner uh, waiting for someone to, to come and help me. And I started reaching out and being a blessing and caring about other people. And as I was doing it, God brought healing into my life. The disciples in this passage, they told Jesus, hey, we want you to come and to stay with us. They took that responsibility to let Jesus into their lives, to let God in, to let others in. To be healed, you have to want to be healed. Many times when we see Jesus ministering to people in the, in the Word of God, he asks them a question. And what was the question? Do you want to be healed? You know, it sounds pretty simple to me, but sometimes people don't want to be healed. They'd rather just hold on to that anger, hold on to that unforgiveness, hold on to that hate, hold on to the hurt and the bitterness. You have to open up and invite God in and invite other people into your life if you want to be healed. If you want to stay hurt, well, just keep doing what you're doing and you'll stay hurt but nothing good will ever come from it. But if you want to be healed, you need to make a decision. You need to take some responsibility. In our story, Jesus came into their life. He stayed with those disciples. His purpose for them was for them to know the truth, for them to be healed, for them to be set free, but also for them to return to the place where they were supposed to be. In the church, in Jerusalem. So, at the meal, he took the bread, and as he was breaking bread, it says their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? He opened up to us the scriptures. It says that their eyes were opened. And when they had received healing, when their eyes were opened, what did they do? they immediately got up and returned to the place where they should have been. They returned to Jerusalem. They returned to their brothers 
and their sisters. They were on the wrong path, but they turned around and they went back to where they should be. I believe that everyone here is in one of two groups this morning. Either you're here and you're hurting, or you're here and God wants to use you to bring healing to somebody who is hurting. It's okay to be in one or the other group, but you need to make a decision, what next? Am I gonna allow someone into my life? Am I gonna allow God into my life? Am I going to reach out to somebody and bring healing into their life? Look around church on Sundays and see who, who, who heal and see who needs healing. See who needs comfort, who needs encouragement, who needs prayer. Because I guarantee that if you look, you'll find. We all need to be like Jesus who is on this road, willing to walk with somebody who is hurt, to meet with him even if they're on the wrong road. Because we need to have Jesus' heart to bring healing to the pain and the hurt. Or if you're in that group of people that are, that are today who are hurting, maybe something isn't right in your life, I encourage you to invite God in today. To invite Him to heal your broken heart. If you're wounded, if you feel empty, if you feel that there's no purpose in your life, know this, that God wants to heal you today. That God wants to show you his purpose for your life. Allow him in and allow your brothers and your sisters in. I'm gonna ask the, uh, the worship team to come forward. And as they're coming forward, I'd like for everyone just to bow their heads for a moment and think about what I've been sharing this morning. Let's just bow our heads and I'd like you to ask God, Lord Jesus, show me if there's any area in my life that you want to heal. And if he shows you something, let him deal with that. You can also ask right now as we're praying, Lord Jesus, how would you want to use me to reach out to others? How can I be a friend to others? How can I be God's hands and his feet and his mouth and bring healing to other people's lives? If you're in that uh, first group of people that is brokenhearted, no matter what the situation or the case may be, I'm going to ask for you to stand up. I know that we don't usually do this, but I'm going to ask for you to stand up just right where you are. And we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that Jesus touch your hearts, that Jesus would touch your lives, that he'd bring healing, that he'd remove all sadness, all depression, and bring joy bring peace, bring comfort. So right now, just stand up if you'd like to receive prayer, and we're going to pray for you. You don't need to be worried what other people are going to think, because we're all wounded at one point or another. And as those that are standing, that are asking for prayer, I'm going to ask those around them that, that don't need prayer, 
If you just go and lay your hands on them and pray that God would bring healing into their lives. We don't have time this morning to, to let people share and to, to counsel, but we can pray that the Holy Spirit would come and touch them right now. So let's just pray together. Lord God, I pray that you would work in our lives. Lord, I pray for every person here that is wounded, that is hurt. Lord, that they would invite you into their heart. Lord Jesus, come and touch them right now. Heal them right now. Set them free right now from the past. Lord, fill them with peace. Fill them with joy. Fill them with your love. Amen. We're going to...